Welcome to tonight's talk, which is the third part of a larger statement titled, Gay Liberation at a Psychological Crossroads, a commentary on the future of homosexual ideology and establishment of the Institute for Contemporary Iranian Psychoanalysis in four parts, delivered in honor of the third anniversary of the Institute. Now, the first two sections of this were called, quote, the golden opportunity to birth a homosexually centered psychoanalysis, unquote and, quote, the new ethical importance of psychological responsibility in furthering the next stage of homosexual emancipation and in founding the ICUP, unquote. Tonight I will present, if I do like this, it means in quotes, the history and development of contemporary Iranian psychoanalysis as a progressive marriage of gay liberation thought and psychodynamic methodology, one gay man's story. With this four-part commentary, I will outline a perspective for considering current liberatory challenges and opportunities facing us as gay and lesbian persons and a community in relation to the founding of the Institute for Contemporary Iranian Psychoanalysis. This is not to imply, in regard to the organized same-sex loving minority, that other kinds of identities, persons, or viewpoints are not important or valid here or elsewhere, only that I will be speaking as a gay-identified homosexual, focusing on gay topicality and signification. I should also point out that I will be doing so as a male homosexual, therefore my comments will, in part, more aptly pertain to gay men, but I hope not to the exclusion of an equitable lesbian appreciation, and my apologies for the inevitable gender bias that is present in these remarks. It actually seems to me that sapphic women's procreative possibilities may realistically be of even greater significance than those of their gay male peers, and I hope that in the future this sublime gynecoid potentiality can be increasingly directly explored and most richly activated. I might also mention that I have chosen to prepare these remarks in writing beforehand and then read them to you here, not only to have the material well thought out and clearly documented in an easy distributed form, but more so through such an appropriately scripted opportunity to somewhat clearly invoke rhetorically, with vigorous thought and sincere feeling, a powerfully stimulative conception of gay psychological valuation provocatively unprecedented in conventional social discourse, and in so doing, to accordingly undergo, with everyone here today, an important and meaningful public ritual, the witnessed incantational performance of that pioneering and vocational statement. As well, I should let you know that this talk will be pretty intellectual in the sense of trying to consider and handle ideas seriously and responsibly, but not too seriously, I hope. And in that sense, the discussion will get fairly dense, even though I have tried to convey its ideational expression in plain English as much as possible. Nonetheless, due to this cumulative intellectual substantiality, it could be a little taxing to keep up with. So I will attempt to read the following statement with that in mind in order to assist the thoughtful listener in better following along. This is also a major reason why we have provided you with a hard copy of the talk when you came in tonight, in case referencing it as I speak may additionally aid in its improved comprehension. Gay Liberation at a Psychological Crossroads the history and development of contemporary Iranian psychoanalysis as a progressive marriage of gay liberation thought and psychodynamic methodology. One gay man's story. What is there after achieving a secure homosexual identity, after gaining the right to gay marriage, after all anti-gay laws have been adequately legally corrected, after homosexuals effectively heal the lingering psychological wounds of internalized homophobic trauma and successfully attain better loving relations with themselves and others, when every goal of the gay rights movement, 
has been satisfied, and living as a valuable homosexual person has been rendered entirely respectfully fulfillable. Some say there will no longer be a special need for gay liberation, community, or even identity, or that these factors will assume much less significance or distinctness to be treated more like eye color or ethnic background. We will all just be people. Such viewpoints could be described in terms of gay theory as strongly assimilationist because they ideologically presume no fundamental difference in being homosexual itself, only the unjustified stigma of social bigotry. Once that form of mean-spirited scapegoating is removed, goes the reasoning, we same-sex loving peoples will turn out to be pretty much like everybody else. It seems to me that this type of vigorous assimilationist approach has come to dominate gay liberation ideology and politics in the homosexual community during the past generation. But there continues to be a vibrant alternative perspective about gay people arising from a contrary sensibility called essentialism, which does not posit the end of gay liberation or personality with the fulfillment of the necessary war against social injustice, but rather the start of a new homosexual renaissance of maturational procreative excellence in being a valuable gay person with vital contributive import for the future of our very planet itself. Indeed, in the mix of assimilationist and essentialist attitudes and feelings that I would suggest has always been present within homosexuals from the start of the modern gay liberation movement of the past approximately 150 years, it is the essentialist sensibility, working in tandem with the desire to be treated equally, that has most so propelled the development of homosexual identity, ideology, community, and terminology. From our movement's original founders, such as the German Karl Ulrichs, the first individual to publicly come out as same-sex loving and argue for a distinct Uranian person and justice-seeking minority, beginning in 1862, all the way to seminal American post-World War II activists like Harry Hay, principal co-founder of the first lasting organization in the U.S., the Mattachine Society in 1950, here in Los Angeles, actually who held that same-sex loving folk constituted a discrete type of people with unique creative qualities and spiritual dimensions. Moreover, the contemporary gay rights movement itself is the direct historical outgrowth of a post-Stonewall liberational absurgence which initially saw homosexual self-acceptance as progressing anywhere but to dissolutional integration into a social power system generally held to be a terminally corrupt and unjust constitution. Yet, not unlike what happened in the 1950s after the early achievements of the radical First Mattachine Society, that 1970s liberatory attitude's very conversional effectiveness unleashed a renewed call to assimilate as well leading to a reductionistic approach which has since come to ideological domination due to its increasing tactical success in a social world increasingly conservative, yet not unreachable, with acceptable appeal. However, this growing integrative success in concert with the diehard nature of persistent bigoted opposition brings a tremendously pertinent focus to the key question of what does lie beyond self-acceptance and equality for today's gay liberation movement. There is no disputing the need to humanize the perception and assessment of gay identified people, and in that sense, gay liberation seeks assimilation into the dignity of man for homosexuals on a par with everyone else, and rightfully so. 
soul. So, there is a strong and valid side to the gay assimilationist impulse that we are, in many powerful ways, just like everybody. Yet, if we follow a strictly, that is, one-sided assimilationist perspective, what we will see is a relative withering away of gay distinctiveness, which prospect accordingly invokes a rather bleak and stultifying sterility as the likely procreative future of being specifically homosexual. In the later part of his life, Harry Hay became quite concerned with this problem of the emancipatory homosexual future, and in fact, it was due to this interest that he, along with his partner John Burnside, myself, and Don Kilhefner, co-founder of the LA Gay and Lesbian Center, began the Radical Fairy Movement in 1979 in order to name, explore, promote, and more so actualize both the humane dignity and the sacred potentiality in being abidingly gay starting from even before the radical fairies, but particularly since then, an entire so-called gay spirituality movement has emerged among gay men, featuring many prominent books, such as Mark Thompson's Gay Spirit, Myth and Meaning, Toby Johnson's Gay Spirituality, my own early work, Visionary Love, in addition to the magazines RFD and White Crane, and ongoing fairy and related organizations and efforts by figures such as Christian de la Huerta in San Francisco, David Nimmons in New York, and Don Kilhefner as well as myself here in Los Angeles. All these post-Stonewall essentialist efforts of a spiritual nature assess a prospective substantiality to being a homosexual person today of a portentous significance that must be better actualized both to gain a fully humanizing gay liberation not sufficiently attainable realistically through a one-sided assimilationist route and also to bring forth crucial creative and healing capacities desperately needed by the same-sex loving community and the entire world. This is the more radical ideological direction, a gay-centered or homosexually-oriented direction that would seek a renewal of our gay liberation movement in the face of assimilationist successes and limitations by affirmatively deepening the appreciation of being distinctly homosexual beyond sexual behaviors, oppression, and words to abidingly essential qualities, characteristics, and possibilities of an authentic and distinguished sacred nature. Of all these efforts to rebalance homosexual ideology by inclusively following out an essentialist perspective on our emancipatory future, however, only that of the Institute for Contemporary Iranian Psychoanalysis focuses on and makes paramount a careful psychological approach to homosexual essence, spirit, and personhood. The previous two talks in this series discuss why such a specialized method of introvert gay activism was being ideologically undertaken in historical, philosophical, and other terms, such as in terms of better addressing the still festering consequences of internalized homophobia in terms of the subjectively stagnating limitations of a one-sided assimilationist stance, in terms of the pivotal evolutionary need of an emancipatory subjective morality to effectively take up personal psychological responsibility, in terms of a more active initiatory engagement with homosexual numinosity, all these interlocking explications were helpful ways 
to begin exploring how and why the gay community today is in a kind of internal dilemma over these necessitous themes, a psychological dilemma, and what then can be done to expeditiously address this difficult crisis, which is to deepen gay liberation theory and practice through enhanced psychological literacy, a project for which the Institute has been cultivating what it calls contemporary Iranian psychoanalysis. Now, that this initial context has been set, in terms of thematically introducing the larger topic of these talks, it would be useful to enter farther into what more particularly involves this newly synthesizing and franchise mental approach. Accordingly, tonight I would like to extend our explorations through looking at that specific historical development by which the method and formulation of a proper homosexual psychology has come, in its primary features, into present institute comprehension.